This episode of All In is brought to you by Time Out for Women. Do you remember those old choose-your-own-adventure books? The ones where, depending on what you choose, you turn to a certain page in the book and that determines your ending? Well, like most things in our world, Time Out for Women looks a little bit different this year. But the folks behind TOFW have been working so hard to bring you incredible offerings that you can access from your home. And they have come up with a choose-your-own-adventure of sorts. For starters, be sure to check out TOFW Tuesdays for live presenter chats on Instagram. But then, for very affordable prices, you can hear from some of your favorite Time Out for Women presenters. You can even find all you need to host a special Girls' Night in. Check out TOFW.com for all the information you need on how to create your own Time Out for Women. Nyland McBain once wrote, how many choices do we each make in a given day? Dozens, hundreds, thousands. With each of these choices, we exercise our most precious God-given right, our agency. Modern Latter-day Saint women choose to prioritize the gospel in their lives, but for each woman, that priority takes a different form. For some, it takes the form of committed motherhood, bringing souls into righteous homes. For Others, it takes the form of humanitarian service. Others serve the broader world in paid industry positions or as creators of artistic works. Women prioritize the gospel in times of crisis when they rely on the Savior or when they change their whole way of life to convert to His church. Today, we talk with Nylan about her work to tell the stories of Latter-day Saint women and why those unique experiences are powerful in today's world. Nylan McBain is co-founder and CEO of Better Days 2020, which celebrates the 150th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote in the state of Utah, the first women to vote in the modern nation, and the centennial of the 19th Amendment through education, events, and the arts. Nylan's previous marketing experience includes in-house positions at Silicon Valley companies, as well as advertising agencies in including a role in the I'm a Mormon campaign, and she brings her understanding of audience and brand to her current work. Since co-founding Better Days 2020, Nylan has become a leader in speaking and writing about women's leadership in the U.S. suffrage movement with a specific focus on Utah and the West's early role in that movement. Her third book, Pioneering the Vote, The Untold Story of Suffragists in Utah and the West, came out in August 2020. Nylan is a graduate of Yale University, the mother of three daughters, and she currently resides in Salt Lake City. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Jones, and I am so excited to have Nylan McBain with me today. Nylan, welcome. Hi, Morgan. Great to be here. Well, I have been looking forward to this interview. I have to tell you, Nyland, so we we spoke on the phone last week for those listening. Nyland knows this. But after we spoke, I I listened to your Fair Mormon talk from five years ago. Was it 2016? Eight, eight years ago. It's 2012. Eight, yeah. Okay. Even even further back. And I was just like mind blown. I read like a good portion of it to my mom on my walk the next morning. So I'm just so excited to talk about it today. (laughs) So first of all, though, let's get a little bit of background on you. You were raised in New York City by your mother, who was an opera singer in the Metropolitan Opera. You've talked about how her church experience kind of shaped yours. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So New York in the 1980s and 90s was a remarkable place to grow up, uh, especially in the church, because it was such a small community then. And members of the church who came to New York really came for deliberate reasons. And they were definitely people who came 
not following a, a common or traditional trajectory, but who came for specific education purposes or specific work purposes or to follow their dreams, you know. And it was, a, it was I think, probably a much more deliberate and radical choice back then for a member of the church to make than perhaps it is now. We have a lot of people in the church going through New York for internships and early jobs in their careers, which is wonderful. And the church is a much stronger and larger presence in the city specifically than it did when I was growing up. But because it was so small when I was growing up, we had a real collegial kind of feeling. And the my mom was a was a sort of linchpin in much of that of that that family uh, that we had in the church at that time. She was a strong personality. She was excelling in a performing art, which especially for women in the church, we have always kind of held up as a as a um, an honorable profession for, for an Elias woman to have. And she was able to convey the spirit very powerfully through her art, which really endeared a lot of people to her, both within the church and outside of the church. So I grew up in what was definitely a bubble. It was a, a very sort of controlled environment for church culture and gospel practices and gospel learning. And I loved it. And it, it balanced really well with some of the other influences that I was getting in my life. As a child in New York, my my father was technically a member, but was really not active. And I had a whole other sort of influence from him and his side of the family. I also went to an all-girls school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, where I was getting, you know, very sort of second wave feminism messages about my my future and and the kind of leadership positions that I was expected to tackle in my future. And so for me, those messages really worked to kind of balance each other out and create a holistic vision of who I wanted to be. For instance, I didn't mind the, you know, emphasis on family and marriage at church because I saw that my mom as a divorced single mother wanted that in her life. I saw that as something to stretch for and an ideal that I wanted for myself. But at the same time, you know, surrounded by professional women, I also saw that the messages I was getting at school were very good and valuable and helpful to me. And I had enough examples of women that were balancing those varying factors that I felt like I could do it myself. So it was it was, for me, it worked. I know for some of the people that I grew up with, it they were they were too conflicting, too many different kinds of messages, and one had to be chosen over the other at some point. But but for me, it worked, and I, I will always credit my mom with that powerful example first and foremost. Yeah. So then, Nylan, as you kind of grew up as as a member of the church, and you lived other places, you talk about how you lived. You were a student at Yale, and then you went to San Francisco. As your experience, church experience progressed, did you feel like you had a really positive experience as a woman in the church? Well, I when I went to college, I had the first inklings that there were some women in the church who didn't have that same really positive feeling that I did. And I did start to experience the imbalance in opportunities that I had, I was hearing about as well as, and specifically, for instance, as I was in college and I, you know, I went to college in Connecticut and, and so we would have, we had a very small uh, ward of, of members and as a member of my, my student wards relief society, I was, in, I was tasked with engaging the undergraduate women in our ward and in, in ward community and getting them involved. And, and it, I saw this just on a very, very simple, basic level, this ability for the men, for the elders quorum to call up the boys and say, Hey, we need you to come and pass the sacrament. The ward will not function without the student, the male students, right? We need you to pass the sacrament. We need you to 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 be there to present the the, the primary ordinance. We need you. There was an undergraduate member in the bishopric, right? He needed to attend uh, in order to conduct the meetings. And we didn't have those same levers for the girls, right? We didn't have anything that we could say to them. If you do not show up, our worship will not be the same, right? Something will be missing. We will not, as a community, be able to worship wholly properly in the same way if you do not show up. And I also had a, a several wonderful leaders in my Yale ward that really helped me open up to the idea of sort of the divine feminine and tapping into 
that power that we have as women, both in a matriarchal sense and also sort of on a on a on a sense of, of more parity with men in a a sense of being of having equal responsibilities to men. So I got I got this very interesting sort of dual intellectual vision into the into the, my role as a woman in the gospel, both as a potential mother and also just as a potential community member who has equal access and rights to priesthood power. As, yeah, as I listen to your, I listened to a few different podcasts with you. And one of the ones that I listened to, you were kind of talking about this, about the need to feel like you're making a contribution that matters and that people will care if you don't show up to church on Sunday. And I grew up in a very small ward. Um, if you could be demoted back down to a branch, we would have been. <laughs> and I always felt like if I didn't show up at church, like somebody would know and it would matter. And and there would be things that wouldn't get done if I didn't go. And then living out in Utah now for a good number of years, it's a very different experience. And it's like, if I don't go to church, no one will probably... Like my friends will notice. But in terms of responsibility, many times you don't feel like it would be that big of a deal. And I do think it's important to feel that sense of contribution and and the sense that you matter. So another thing that you said, Nylan, is that you served with a woman in a, a Relief Society presidency who had her name removed immediately following getting released from the Relief Society presidency. Is that right? Yes. And she cited the inability to reconcile her role as a woman in the church. So for you, when you have served with somebody, I can only imagine I, I have had the chance to serve in Relief Society presidencies with these, with incredible women and you become really close. And so when you've had that experience, how does that affect you and your testimony? So one thing to recognize about church administration is, and that I've learned over the last decade of doing this, is that, um, you know, we as, as much as we like to standardize the structure and the procedures, the cases really do vary by ward and by stake and by individual, right? There's so many times where personality really comes into play and even the best intended structures and the best intended policies uh, personality and indip- individual dynamics uh, really do uh, do do guide the the interactions. So the the first caveat is that you know this 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 was a this was a situation in which big personalities clashed first of all, and I want to acknowledge that. But on the other hand, you know this was also a situation where a professional woman in an urban environment who you know, essentially ran her own business in her personal life, right? Her, her professional life was up against somebody who she felt like was a no, a no voice in her life, right? Um, and she didn't feel that sort of camaraderie and that counseling that we talk about a lot in the church in her efforts to guide the, not just the women of the church, but to share stewardship over the whole membership of her ward. And, and so I think since then, that was, you know, 15 plus years ago, I think we've done a better job talking about the counseling uh, aspect of ward councils, for instance, and the, the need for leaders within the ward to really share stewardship and share guidance with each other over the entire ward, not just over, you know, the 12 year old girls who they may have stewardship over, but really consider themselves to be stewards over the whole ward. And I think we've done a better job with that. But at the same time, we still come up against that, that sort of disconnect of, you know, well, we are all servant leaders, but some of us have more important titles than others do, right? So you have the Relief Society president, but by the nature of the structure of the organization, always deferring to the bishop, no matter how kind, no matter how conciliatory, no matter how listening that bishop is, right? The structure demands this particular hierarchy. And so we're all, that's always intention. I think we always feel like, yes, we're supposed to be counseling together, but you know, is the father really the head of the home? Isn't the bishop really the person that has the final say? Right. And, and so I think, you know, if, when you have a structure in which no woman is, you know, women always have a man above them, whether it's on the local ward level or it's on the general level, um, you're always going to come up against that. I'll just share a, a quick example from history. 
um, you know, I've spent the last several years delving into Utah history, which has necessitated, of course, getting into deep into to LDS women's history and specifically the, the women who really led Utah's efforts in the suffrage movement, and the, the movement to get the women the right to vote both here in Utah and nationally. And the leader of Utah's suffrage movement was a woman named Emmeline B. Wells. And Emmeline is my personal hero. She was a rabble rouser. She met four U.S. presidents in her work for women. She edited the longest running suffrage newspaper in the country, was a dear good friend of Susan B. Anthony's, and really spent her whole career sort of demanding this expanded role and expanded vision of women's capabilities. And one of the things that I love is when I tell people about Emmeline and they ask me, you know, well, what did the church do about her? You know, how, how did the brethren handle a woman like this, in other words, right? And I love being able to say, well, they made her General Relief Society president because they did. They, they, they elevated her in our, in our hierarchy to the, the steward over all of the women of the church in her later life after she'd done all of this advocacy work. So really quickly, before we get a little bit deeper into these things, I want to kind of touch on a couple of the things that you've worked on that have given insight into women's experiences within the church. You have worked, what year did you start the Mormon Women Project? Yeah, it was, I started it in 2008. Okay. And I think we launched in January of 2009 with 18 interviews. And you have interviewed how many people now? So probably on the site, there's close to 500 interviews. And I myself probably did over 100 of those. Amazing. And so the idea with this is to interview women from all over the world going through all different things. I think the the most recent article that I saw on there yesterday was about a lady who was addicted to prescription medication. Does that sound right? Mm-hmm. And I, I loved reading that. I think that there are so many, so many different things that women are going through in the church. And So I just wondered from your experience and having been a part of such a massive project, what have been your biggest takeaways? Um, And I'm sure that you came into this with expectations of what you hope to accomplish, but how has it exceeded your expectations? Yeah, those are great questions. I mean, I look back on those experiences and I'm sure you can sympathize with this since you you interview so many people. It was a very, very sacred time and a sacred experience to be able to get into people's spiritual journeys and and really, really plumb the depths of those with them in that in that format. My goal going into it, I was coming out of sort of early, you know, young adulthood. I'd been out of college for ten years, and I had seen. Uh, those some of those trends that we talked about earlier from my college and young adult days continue to play out. And I had friends who you know were distancing themselves from the church because of gender issues. And I just thought about this well of women that I had had in that in that bubble in New York and beyond in San Francisco and Boston by that time, who really had been examples to me. and I, I just wanted to share their experiences to show that there were many ways to choose the right. That was kind of the, I, I've always had in my mind this image of balancing personal revelation with obedience, right? I think for women, we have in past generations maybe overemphasized obedience and a particular vocational pursuit of motherhood as the way to to be obedient to our our divine identities. And I think, you know, from my from my mom's experience, she overemphasized personal revelation, right? And so I've always kind of balanced those two. I have this wonderful story, just as an aside, of my mom in 1965. She actually sang one of uh, her first solo recitals uh, at BYU. She had actually graduated from BYU and then was singing uh, professionally in Salt Lake at, at the new Utah Opera. It had just started, and she went back to, to BYU and did a solo concert. And after the concert, Hugh Nibley came up to her, you know, who who is a a, a giant in at BYU and in our intellectual community as a scholar. And and he came up to her and he said, well, you know, Sister Bybee, that was that was very lovely. But what are you going to do once you get married and start having children? I mean, how can you keep this up? You're not going to be able to keep doing this. And I remember the first time my mom told me that story. And I looked at her and I just said, Mom, what did you do? It was Hugh Nibley. Weren't you terribly? I mean, she was 23 years old. Wasn't she terribly intimidated? Right. And she just looked at me like I was crazy. And she said, well, I ignored him, of course, you know, and I just, that, I love that story because it, it does kind of say, well, you know, on one hand you can have, you could react to that so many different ways. Right. 
And she chose to, to really emphasize that personal revelation, knowing herself so well and knowing what was right for her. And I think going into the Mormon Women Project, that was what I was seeking. I was seeking a silver bullet that told me, this is why some women are able to thrive within church culture that may overemphasize obedience over their, that they, that they may feel like, you know, their personal choices about their vocations and their professions and the, what they pursue in terms of their identity. What is it that allows them to work within a culture and, and, and thrive and, and, and really emphasize that personal revelation element like my mom did. And I, the answer is I didn't find a silver bullet. Every woman's life is so nuanced and so complex that there is, of course, no, you know, cookie cutter, obedient, purely obedient woman who's, who's, who's following the stereotype. And if we, if we think we found her, we just need, need to dig deeper. But I did find that that the women that I interviewed had a sort of well of, of, of confidence and the self-assurance and self-knowledge that was very inspiring to me and that I really found very moving and very sacred. And so I, I loved doing those interviews. I also loved really exploring the range of, of church membership. I remember I interviewed the first mem- female member of the church in, in Russia and in Moscow and she joined the church, I think, in 1990 in Moscow. And we were able to to interview women from about, by the time I finished as the editor, I, I think I'd done about 22 different countries. And I think they've expanded to about over 30 countries now uh, within the project. So it's been, it was an incredibly rewarding project for me personally. Yeah. There's something about talking with somebody about something as personal as their faith that is just unmatched. And so I'm jealous. I'm actually jealous that well, you got to interview that many, that many incredible... You're women. on your way. You're doing uh, but I, 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 I think it's also so cool because on the flip side, you also had the chance to work through Bonneville Communications on I Am a Mormon. And you've kind of talked about how you had an interesting balance between those two things. Because on one hand, you had these women from all over the world. And then you had I am a Mormon that was a little bit different, but also kind of the same thing kind of showing that there were all different paths to being a member of the church. And I think I I love something that you said in one of the podcasts that I listened to where you said, Latter day Saint women write their own script. And so as you were involved with I Am a Mormon, how did your unique background, both with your mom and New York and then and then the Mormon Women Project, how did all of that kind of influence that experience at Boncom? Yeah. I the I was really grateful to have that that experience at, at Boncom and it came it kind of fell into my lap. I got a call, I think the day Mormon.org launched from one of their brand strategists. And he said, you know, we're here brainstorming a new campaign for the church. And we're a bunch of dudes sitting around a table and we're trying to figure out how to talk to everybody, not just other dudes. So he was familiar with the Mormon Women Project and reached out to me because of of that. Ironically, he wasn't familiar with the fact that I had just spent seven years in Silicon Valley doing digital marketing and brand strategy. So I went in with, with, you know, I think more thorough qualifications than they might have expected initially, which was great because that allowed me to work on many other things as well at Boncom, aside from I'm a, I'm a Mormon. But initially, it was interesting with I'm a Mormon, you know, I think the Mormon Women Project was was seen as a, as a sort of source material for some of the videos that, that they were doing for the for the campaign, but the the work that I was doing on the on the MWP was much different. It was, you know, as 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 we sort of explained, it was a, a very sort of intimate, sacred exploration of a woman's personal journey in you know a four thousand word transcribed interview, like really really meaty, lengthy stuff, right? Um, and I'm a Mormon was you know something I was also familiar with from my advertising and marketing experience, but it was short, punchy, visual two to three minute videos. Um, right. And so, so it's a very different way of telling women's stories and, and both are extremely valuable and both, both were needed, but it, it really it was an interesting education for me in, in all the different ways to be able to tell a story and all the different ways to be able to, to share the, the, the diversity of our experiences. 
Yeah. Why do you think, Nylon, that it was important that that campaign show us different kinds of Latter-day Saint women? And then also with that, I can't help but think, like for me, one person that made a deep impact on the way that I wanted to live as a Latter-day Saint woman was Jane Clayson Johnson. And so I think that there were different women that were a part of that campaign that kind of it was, they didn't totally fit the mold, right? That we think of as the traditional um, woman in the church, but it gave us kind of, it kind of shook up that, that stereotype. So why do you think that that was important? And do you think that that was successful? Yes. So great questions. I think, you know, the process of globalizing the church and, and creating an institution that really works outside of Utah and outside of the United States started, you know, earlier in the 20th century, definitely. But I think the, the, the profile of the membership was really something that had to be tackled in order for the church to continue its growth trajectory at that point in history. So at the beginning of the 21st century, we enjoyed global growth. At one point, we, we tipped to more members outside of the United States than inside of the United States. You know, and yet I, you know, we still have so many of the trappings of a sort of in mid-century American institution, right? And that was very painful and painfully clear to me growing up in New York, where we would have, you know, the missionaries work so hard to, to baptize members, you know, immigrants or people from other denominations, especially if they were coming from you know, black churches in Harlem, for instance, and they would come to our church and they would just be like, no way am I going to keep, you know, singing, singing these boring hymns in a dirge like manner, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and feeling like I'm the only person that yeah, is exactly. of a different I mean, race. Yeah, Exactly. So it's, so, I mean, there, it was, it, it was absolutely essential for growth that we shed some of that, the, some of those, those cultural trappings. And it was, it was a painful a painful transition and it's a transition is still happening. I remember one of my first days at Boncom after we had launched some of the early video portraits, our, our managing director sat us down and read us a letter that had been written by a man to, you know, to us generally that said, my wife has been on the couch in a depression for the last couple of days because the church's fancy PR agency is showing a woman who has pursued a career. Whereas my wife, you know, gave up her education and her pursuits so that she could raise a family the way the prophet told her to. And now, you know, you're telling her that she didn't have to do that. She didn't have to make that sacrifice and real anger and real confusion. And, you know, I, I got that. I got that. You know, I, I, one of the things that prompted me to start the MWP was this tension that I felt growing up between my mom being, you know, a, a woman who did not have a temple marriage, a single mother who was professional international career being held up in all the church videos and singing for president Hinckley's birthday parties. And I was on the fireside circuit, right. And got to meet several of the apostles, which was wonderful for my personal testimony. And again, back to, you know, sort of my sense of myself as a woman in the church. But I did recognize the hypocrisy of that, especially in the 1980s and 90s, when we were not very far from President Benson's call to women to stay home. And so I think, you know, women in the church have always kind of suffered from that, that tension. And the I'm a Mormon campaign and things like the Mormon Women Project have been efforts to alleviate that tension. And to say, you know, again, that balance between, you know, what is, what is a cultural practice, or what is obedience to a particular cultural expectation, or a narrowly prescribed role versus all the rest of life, right? And all these other things that we can do as women, and all the other ways to write our scripts. And I think, you know, it's been a really important pendulum swing for all of us who are trying to live in the modern world and still recognize our eternal identities. Yeah, I think it's so important too to note that marriage and family, sometimes no matter how hard you try, it's not happening for you. Or, or you have a choice, you know, do I 
settle just to get this thing that I supposedly am, am longing for? Or do I wait and, and get what I feel like I deserve? And I think that has been an interesting thing in my experience is I have, it's taken a long time to get to this point. But I think I finally got to a point a couple of years ago where I was like, no, I don't think that, that God's plan for me has gone wrong. I think that this is exactly what he wanted for me. And if he wanted me to be married, I would be married and I'm not. And so I think that it goes back to that idea of personal revelation. But I, I do think it's so important to recognize that that marriage and family is not something to be achieved. It's something that that happens sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. And it's kind of, in my opinion, a, a healthy, happy marriage and family in many ways is something that is out of our control when it happens, if that makes any sense. Oh, I love to hear you say that, Morgan. That's wonderful. You know, I have three daughters and statistically one of them will not get married. Right. Uh, And, and I think, you know, retaining membership, you know, not to mention shepherding people on the covenant path and, and helping them maximize their spiritual potential you know, the, the, the sheer membership retention statistic alone requires us to craft a space for, for people like the, you know, that are, that are in that particular demographic, uh, and embrace it fully and make sure that all the opportunities to live, you know, fully explored and adventurous and big lives are celebrated at every turn. I completely agree. Nyland, you mentioned that you have been working on this Better Days 2020 nonprofit for the last how many years? Has it been more than five? No, it's about four years. Yeah. We started in 2016. And the whole goal of this was to shine a light uh, on the history of women in Utah and their their role in gaining the right to vote. You and I talked last week on the phone and, and you mentioned what you call empathetic activism. And to me, what I think of when I hear that is when we haven't necessarily had the same experience as someone else, but we're able to have empathy for that person and then be an advocate for someone, even if maybe their experience has not been our experience. But can you explain to me for you what empathetic activism means and what that would look like within a church context right now? Yeah, I, I think my background has kind of caused me to, to fall into this position of empathetic activism. I I feel like I've developed some principles around it along the way, both with the Mormon Women Project and with my work at Boncom and Better Days 2020 and sort of my marketing work in general. I think my marketing work in general has allowed me to always start with the audience in mind. Who who am I speaking to? And what has what experiences have brought them to this point? What motivates them? I, I mean, when I was working in retail, retail e-commerce marketing back in San Francisco, I was always fascinated by the in-store experience, right? How, how do you lay out a store to get people to make a purchase decision? I think that kind of psychology is really fascinating. And so I think I've applied that to my activism work as well. And um, also, I think because I grew up with a foot in a couple of different worlds, it's allowed me to sort of pivot and, and, and bridge my perspective when needed. And so, so I think empathetic activism is about being very clear about the values that you want to espouse. And it's a very deliberate practice of moving someone towards your values, but with a sense of doing it, not just because of a sense of power, like I talked about earlier, it's not a power grab. It's because of a sense of that you think the world is going to be a better place and that you have experiences and, and, and personal data points to support that, that persuasive action of, and, and the, the good of those values that you're persuading people to follow. Quite honestly, all of our missionary work is empathetic activism. If members of the church don't think they're activists, they are. It's what we do. Missionary work is empathetic activism because it is an effort to deliberately persuade others to espouse our values because we think that they lead to a particularly fulfilling way of life. 
right? And and so similar to missionary work, I think some of the first principles are that you try to put yourself in the other person's shoes. You try to you t- try to have a wide embrace and you decide what you're going for and not what just just what you're against. I think right now in a time of hyperactivism and and protesting, one of the things that I really admire about about cer- certain activists is how they have a, a positive stance. They know exactly what they're for, not just what they're for what they're against. They also understand that history was not that long ago. That you know when we're talking about areas of activism such as Black Lives Matter or the Me Too movement, like these things may not be a part of our lives today as you and me as, you know, white women living in Utah, but the history is very pre- present in, in, and we need, and it's not as far away as we think it is. We, it's not something that happened so long ago at the, in the past that the repercussions aren't still alive today. They are. Another principle that I really uh, think is a key cornerstone of empathetic activism is the idea or the, the mantra, shall we say, the, the convincing of oneself that there are no villains. While that may or may not be true, I think it's been really important for me to always take, to always assume that nobody's out to get me. Nobody's trying to be malicious, no matter what kind of dumb things they say or what mean, or, you know, degrading things they might say or patronizing things. No one's trying to be malicious, right? I always, you always try to give the benefit of the doubt and you try to, to again, sort of understand why they're saying what they're saying. And, you know, I think, for me, over the past 10 years, that approach has been called both, you know, an apostate and naive. <laughs> and I take pride in both of those because I feel like, you know, if you're if you're not aggregating the edges, then you're not speaking for the middle. And I like speaking for the middle. There are a lot of people in the middle that often feel like they need to get pulled to the edges. And I feel like if I can be very clear on my principles and my values and express love and admiration while still seeking for improvements and a better way, then that is showing the ultimate love for things that I care deeply about. Yeah. Nylan, I just had a question come to me and I I want to ask you, so you mentioned you've gotten criticism from both sides and I think that you've walked a very fine line. <laughs> and so for you... Why is the gospel of Jesus Christ worth all that effort to you? Why is it worth walking that fine line? Oh, I mean, because what else is there worth working on? <laughs> I mean, if 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 the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't succeed, I mean, what's the point of anything, right? I, I feel like this is the lens through which I see existence and it informs everything that I do and my whole sense of self. And that doesn't mean it has to dictate the way I see everything and my, the way I see myself. It means that it informs it, which means that I, it's a lens through which I see the world, but I can take that lens off and I can see what my life would be like without it. I can see where it might hinder me in some areas. I can see where it might be limiting in some areas. And I can see where also it is empowering and strengthening in some areas. And I just feel like it's the ultimate thing worth working towards and fighting for. If our people are not happy within the church institution, then that is at the core of salvation, right? And it's my way of doing that missionary work. I didn't go on a mission. I'm not a very good missionary. And I feel like this is, you know, keeping people tethered to their covenants is what it's all about. And keeping people tethered to their covenants can be different than having people tethered to church culture. (laughs) And I feel like that that message is the way that I can uh, contribute to the kingdom. For sure. I love at the end of that fair Mormon talk that you gave, you said there was a woman involved in almost every one of the Savior Jesus Christ's mortal milestones from the very first miracle facilitated by his mother to revealing himself as the living water to being the subject of numerous parables to being anointed by a woman hours before his death to being the first witness of the resurrection. Women were not just bystanders, but engaged contributors to his ministry. They were 
were symbols of the extent to which the Savior was willing to challenge the conventions of his culture and usher in a new social ideal. Compared to the way women were treated in the Savior's own time and place, his treatment of them was radical. How, Nylan, have you felt the Savior encouraging you along in this endeavor? Well, I, I do want to speak for a moment to that comment. I, I, you know, it's been a long time since I read that talk and hearing you read it back to me reminds me of this book that I, that I just read by Sue Monk Kidd called The Book of Longings. Have you heard I've of this? I've heard of this. I've heard of it. You got to go read it. Um, <laughs> It's it's one of, a part of a wonderful genre of literature that I love, which is sort of exposing and excavating women in the scriptures. And, and Sue Monk Kidd, who's a very talented spiritual writer, creates a fictional wife of Jesus. And it's not Mary Magdalene or any of the usual suspects, but she's a she's a, a, a fictional character. But in in writing the book, Sue Monk Kidd did extensive research into the way women were treated in the Savior's time. And hearing you read that quote back to me, I've just been learning even more recently about how degraded women were at that time. Uh, And reading that novel and all the research that went into that really, really kind of helped me understand just how how radical the savior was. We we would call we call him a disruptor these days, right? And and I I think that I gain a lot of confidence from that. I gain a lot of. I feel like you know if we're going to the savior for our example in all things, I don't need to worry about what anybody else is telling me or what anybody else has done. I need to continue going back to the source. And I think writers like Sue Monk Kidd and some of the evangelical writers that I've read in my life actually have really helped me go back to the source. Because I think one of the things we're blessed with in the gospel is having additional books of scripture and modern day prophets and general conference magazines every six months and a whole body of literature, right? And there's so much we have to digest. And I think sometimes when we go to other worship practices, we're reminded that, you know, while that all is a tremendous blessing and gives us much more depth to the gospel and our understanding of our purpose here on earth, all you really need is Jesus, right? And, and I think that looking at his example and constantly being reminded of how the savior favored the underdog and went against the conventions of his time gives me the confidence that I need is really the only thing that I need to feel like there's room for exploration and for a little bit more disruption in our lives today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Nyland, my last question for you is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yeah, I think um, I, I kind of touched on on some of the principles that would that guide my answer to that already. Which, uh, and I think the best metaphor for me for for how I would define being all in is this idea of a lens or or glasses. Um, I talk a lot about glasses when I'm talking about gender issues in the church because I think we look through so many different kinds of lenses when we process our experiences in this world. We can look through the lenses of our vocations. We can look through the lenses of our families and our our childhood experiences and our mental health situations. And I think for me, being all in in the gospel of Christ means that first and foremost, the lens that I put on top of everything else that I choose first when I'm trying to process something or experience something or understand something is always, how would Jesus see this? What would Jesus do? What does Jesus want of me? And that's always the very first lens that I try to put on, not, you know, will this, what would my mother think of this? Or will this make me more popular with other people? Or will this help me get ahead at work? Or, you know, what do I, you know, what do I think of this politician? It's really, you know, from what I understand from the scriptures and that both the Savior's intimate life and also the themes that are presented in the scriptures, that is the first filter through which I try to put things. And I, I think that's important to me. That, that metaphor has become important to me because as I talk about gender issues with people in the church, oftentimes, and for my own children, I'll challenge them to take off the gender lens you know, oftentimes the gender lens comes first and sometimes it needs to come first. And it's important for there to be a gender lens on there, right? If I, 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 I'm, and I'm trying to evoke this, like if you're sitting in the eye doctor's chair, right? He's putting different lenses in and you're like, is that an E or a house or whatever, (laughs) right? 
if you put in that gender lens, you will see the church differently. And it can, it can be challenging. And that lens is important. And we all need to have that lens on at times, because that's how we're going to become better. But I think for me, being all in means that I always prioritize and I always leave in that lens of trying to be in the Savior's heart and mind and see things from a loyalty to Him first and foremost. Thank you so much, Nyland. You are so smart and I am just over here trying to keep up, but oh. thank you so much for sharing so many wonderful thoughts with us. Oh, thank you, Morgan. You do such a wonderful job. Thanks for preparing so well. A huge thank you to Nyland McBain for joining us on today's episode. You can find Nyland's new book, Pioneering the Vote, The Untold Story of Suffragists in Utah and the West at Deseret Book Now. Thank you to Derek Campbell of Mitz at Six Studios for his help with this and every episode of this podcast. And thank you so much for listening. We'll be back with you again next week.